we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna spend some time talking about EKGs. It's uh, a subtle ACS, and just to skip to the chase, we're gonna jump right into a case, and I want you to focus on lead V1. All right, who in the world ever pays attention to lead V1? After today, I hope everybody will. So, a 61-year-old woman comes in with subdural chest pressure, shortness of breath, symptoms improve with nitroglycerin. So, we're pretty concerned about this patient. There is the initial 12 lead ECG. All right, take a look at lead V1. Any concerns there? The computer is calling this non-specific, and so the emergency physician and the subsequent cardiology read is just non-specific ST T wave changes. All right, well, 61 years old, she got better with nitro. We're going to bring her in anyway. Here's the baseline ECG, by the way. Let's see. Let me go back. Here's what we're dealing with. Take a look at V1, and the baseline is right up here, okay? So I think you've seen a change there. Symptoms worsen, and so, once again, the importance of serial ECGs. We're not gonna just settle for the first one. Symptoms are persisting. First one's non-diagnostic, persistent symptoms, so we're gonna get serial ECGs. Here's the first ECG I just showed you. 20 minutes later, this is what we have. 20 minutes later, take a look at V2 also. 20 minutes later, Take a look at V2. And about 20 minutes later, again, full-blown Wellens. Patient goes up to the cath lab and has proximal LAD occlusion. And the only thing that started in V1 was what? A new tall T wave in lead V1. Now, who in the world ever pays attention to V1, let alone the T wave in V1? I think the T wave is kind of the underdog of the EKG. Nobody ever pays attention to the EKG. And I'm pointing at the T wave in V6 also. Compare the sizes. Notice that the T wave in V1 is larger than the T wave in V6. So who cares? Well, you need to care. Here's the baseline again. This is a new upright tall T wave in V1. So what does the literature actually say about the T wave in V1? The normal T wave in V1 is supposed to be inverted. Sometimes it can be flat. This is a normal ECG. You'll see it's inverted. Flat is okay. Maybe a tiny bit elevated or, or upright is okay, but it shouldn't be large and upright. So what's the significance of a large upright T wave in V1? There's actually literature that's talked about this. This can be a sign of underlying cardiac disease. In particular, if it's new and upright compared to the baseline, it is a type of hyperacute T wave. Essentially, you've got a hyperacute T wave, which is initially just limited to lead V1. You get some serial ECGs, it starts spreading, and it can turn into a full-blown STEMI. Marriott, who's one of the real gurus in history of EKGs, went so far as to say that the T wave in V1 should, in general, never be larger than the T wave in V6, if it is upright. What he referred to, he referred to that as loss of precordial T wave balance. I referred to that as the NTT V1, the new tall T wave in V1. When you see a new tall T wave in V1, you've got to worry about this, all right? And the important thing to keep in mind is that when a patient's having a STEMI, the very first thing that happens is sometimes the reciprocal change, sometimes AVL, sometimes this new tall T wave in V1 can be the very first thing that you see and as we saw in the example. So get serial ECGs. Let me show you a different case. This is a great case. I was working with the resident, and the resident came walking out of the room, kind of dejected, and I said, what's the matter? He said, oh, Dr. Matu, I hate chest pain. I said, oh, you're killing me. I love chest pain. Don't say that to me. I love chest pain. It's all about the history, 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 right? He says, no. I said, why do you hate chest pain? He says, we just admit everybody. No, that's not true. We can send people home if the history doesn't. All right, so go ahead. Tell me what's going on. He said, I've got a 78-year-old guy, and he's got nothing. He's got poking chest pain, and we're probably going to admit him. I said, no, poking is not ACS. Poking is not ACS. So he said, all he's got is poking. So I said, are you sure he's got no shortness of breath, diaphoresis, nausea, vomiting, nothing? And he said, no, he's got nothing else. So I said, all right, just you watch. I don't care if he's 78. If I'm going to go in the room, I'm going to do my own history, and if he truly has nothing but poking, just you watch. We're going to send him home. So I can see his resident's eyes lighten up, and so I'm heading into the room, and now I'm thinking, my God, I just told him we're about to send home a 78-year-old with chest pain. So, so I'm, I'm trying to pull anything out of this guy. I was like, you sure you didn't get a little warm and diaphoretic? No. Did you get any vomiting? Even a little nausea? No. I'm using nonverbal cues. You had radiation down the left arm. This shows it. <laughs> nothing. He's got nothing going on. So I come out of the room and I say, you know, you're right. He's got poking. He's got nothing. But it's actually the, the history and the EKG. All right, so let's get an EKG. So we get an EKG. He's got this upright T wave in V1, which is kind of perhaps larger than the T wave in V6, maybe about the same size. Uh, you know, it's probably old. Let's get an old EKG. It's a new. <laughs> 
tall T wave in V1. So now this is something that it was a number of years ago. I'd read about this. Marriott talked about it. And, and you know, I have so much respect for Marriott. What he says is like gold to me. And I found myself thinking, well, Marriott can't be right because poking is not chest pain. And I found myself trying to talk myself out of this. And I just told a resident, poking's not chest pain. Finally, I figured, you know what? I shouldn't try to talk myself out of this. So I said to the resident, you know what? He's 78, he's got chest pain. Screw the history, just admit him. <laughs> so, so, so now we've got to call the cardiologist and try to admit this guy. I can't let the resident do this. He's gonna get grilled for this. So I, I thought, all right, I'm gonna call the cardiologist myself and I'll see, he's having a busy night. I'll see if I can fly this by. So I call him up. Dr. Jones, this is Dr. Matun, the emergency department. We've got an elderly guy here with atypical chest pain. He's got some subtle changes on the EKG. I'm gonna see if I can just bring him into the hospital. He says, all right, fine, that sounds good. Yes. And he says, what's he got on the EKG? Ugh. So, so I said, well, you know, now I knew this is something he probably doesn't know because in general, if the cardiologist doesn't love reading about EKG stuff, he's not gonna know what I'm talking about. So I had to pull a little communication tactic that I like calling, um, that I like to call, throwing your consultant an as you know. <laughs> <laughs> and it was something like this. Well, he's got this new upright T wave in lead V1. And as you know, Marriott has referred to this as highly concerning for proximal LED disease. All right. Now, a couple of tips about the as you know. If you throw out as you knows, number one, you can't make stuff up. OK, <laughs> so, so, otherwise you lose credibility. Number two, it helps if you can quote the name of somebody well known in their specialty. And then number three, whenever you throw out an as you know, it's always followed by a couple of seconds of dead silence, okay? <laughs> and what's happening here is your consultant is thinking, hmm, this guy's quoting me something from my literature that I've never heard of before, and he thinks I know what he's talking about. I've got two choices. Either I can just play along, or I can say, oh, I've never heard of that before. Please teach me something about my literature. And in my experience, the more postgraduate years of training your consultant has, the more likely they'll just play along, right? So in, interventional cardiologists pretty much always play along. If it's a CT surgeon or neurosurgeon, they'll actually claim to have written the paper. <laughs> so, anyway, so, so, so I said, you know, so he said, all right, fine, just go ahead and bring him into the hospital. And sure enough, the night of his admission, this is what happened. And he went to the cath lab, big LAD disease. Couple other cases, 89 year old who gets admitted for a TIA hypertension, diabetes, the night of her admission, she developed this, by the way, here's her admission EKG, normal. The night of her admission, she developed some chest pain while in the hospital on the neuro service. They got a 12 lead, and here's the new EKG. Right up there, new tall T wave in V1. They sent some troponins, consult cardiology, cardiology fellow comes by, weighs her hands, it's okay. Patient ended up getting some aspirin, and everything else, discharged a few days later, came back during one of my shifts with this, uh, with, this EKG, and she went into cardiogenic shock a few hours later, and I pronounced her dead in the emergency department. You just wonder if somebody had known about that T-wave abnormality a few days earlier, whether her outcome could have been a lot different. Here's a 54-year-old with belching, burning, sounds like reflux. The patient gets a little bit better with Malox, and here's the EKG, symptom-free, all right? Upright T wave, we don't have an old one for comparison. It's not larger than the T wave in V6. So we said, you know what? Let's just watch the patient for a while. The patient develops recurrent chest pain while in the ED. So we get a repeat EKG and take a look on the repeat EKG. The T wave has gotten bigger. The T wave is now larger than T wave in V6. You know, wow, that's, that's a really subtle call, right? But we said, you know what? We're gonna admit the patient. We got the patient admitted. And then the next morning, this is what the EKG looked like. Patient went right to the cath lab. The first thing that showed up was nothing more than that tall T wave in V1, all right? It's documented in the literature, be wary. Now there's some times where a tall T wave in V1 is perfectly normal. What's the abnormality here? Lead reversal, V1 and V3 got switched, all right? So be on the lookout for that, all right? You just switch the leads back and it's perfectly fine. The other two things to keep in mind, left bundle is off, it's totally normal to have a big T wave in V1 and left bundle, no problem. LVH oftentimes has a big T wave in V1, no problem. Young people with high voltage often have big T waves in V1, no problem, all right? But if you see a new tall T wave in V1 in a person with active pain 
and it's not LVH or left bundle or high voltage, you've got to worry that that's a hyperacute T wave and that person is on the way to having an anterior STEMI, get serial EKGs, and you just might pick up the early STEMI. All right? Thanks, folks. Thank you.